we and every decent person in this world are shocked by the war that has broken out in Israel. How can you not be horrified by the brutal atrocities against innocent civilians, men, women, children, elderly, in the most horrible way, abused, not just murdered and killed. And that most, if not the entire world, is united. How do we react to this? What should be our approach? And what can we do about it? There are many, many questions. But most importantly, is what is our role in a historic time like this? This is clearly a watershed moment, a game changer. And the annals of history will look back at this time and say, what did I do? What did you do? So to help, I can't say clarify, but to shine some light into understanding these events, these tragic events, and the war that has been launched, Operation Iron Swords, and so much more to come that we can't even predict, please join me in this timely and critical discussion. Why? How? What can we do? How to react to the tragic war in Israel? Hi, this is Simon Jacobson. A consideration of the unprecedented turn of events in the Middle East, in Israel, in Gaza, through a special program called Why? How? What can we do? How to react to the tragic war in Israel? This program is dedicated by Todor Gorgiev in honor of Jewish people all around the world. When tragedy strikes, when innocent people are killed, when anyone is killed, but especially in such a brutal massacre way, as has been noted, that this, since the Holocaust, there haven't been that many Jews killed in one day. The count is already at 1,200. Men, women, children, elderly, mercilessly, indiscriminately, murdered, massacred, beheaded. I don't want to go into graphic details, but if you're aware, it's horrible. Hopefully the count stops here. This is based on the incursion, an attack on October 7th, Saturday morning in Israel, which is a holiday, one of the greatest holidays, Simchat Torah. So while Jews were celebrating, including celebrating at a festival, innocent people, as I said, were massacred in a pogrom that even the, heart, the heart most hardened military and media could not bear to look at it, to look at the bodies, mutilated, tortured. Over 150 people taken hostage and thousands more wounded and injured. And I include also all those killed in Gaza, civilians, non-civilians. Every death is a tragedy. 
So I want to begin firstly by simply acknowledging the dignity of life. That our hearts, our souls, our prayers go out and are broken for those sacred souls that were taken from us. For their shattered families. And our prayers and hearts and souls go out to the IDF, to the Sahal, to the soldiers who are actively now standing on the front lines, sacrificing their lives to, to protect and defend innocent people, innocent Jews in Israel. There's so many things to discuss, and I have released a whole bunch of short videos answering different questions that are coming in. What I want to focus here is primarily the most important questions that we're asking and above all, what we can do and what we should do. It's been pointed out by many that if the enemies of Israel will lay down their arms in total and, and authentic peace, there would be peace in the entire region. If the Israelis laid down their arms, I don't even want to mention it, they would be annihilated. The hatred and the simple lack of civility in how to fight a war. As I said, it's shocking everyone. So despite the carnage, despite the losses, we cannot deny the fact how just in one day so much has changed. Firstly, on a very basic ground level, Israel was experiencing tre tremendous rifts between the secular, between the religious. Suddenly there's an unprecedented unity, a show of love, unconditional love, in the support of the, of the army, of the military, in support of each other. Do we need tragedy for us to come together? Well, that's what happened. The entire world, even countries that are generally usually against Israel, are standing in solidarity. We hope it lasts, whether in France, in Sweden, in London, of course, in the United States. President Biden said extremely strong words, which I take sincerely, of his unwavering support and the United States' unwavering support. And how could you not when you see just some of those images coming out? And unprovoked. Absolutely. So it brings us to another clarity, the clarity of good and evil and right and wrong. Let's take World War II. It took a while for the United States to join Pearl Harbor and then seeing what the Nazis were capable of. But once it was clear, that, mortal, that moral conviction is critical to have clarity, what is right, what is wrong both from a perspective of a country fighting a war and from a perspective of the military involved in it. Contrast it with Vietnam. Most military, most government officials didn't know at the end of the day why we're fighting this war. So here there's that moral conviction, that absolute clarity. People can have extreme disagreements, but that's not the way. Beheading is not the way we deal with it. That takes a whole new dimension, Nazi-like. And especially when it's targeting Jews who have suffered for thousands of years in this fashion. So this clarity is critical. I know there's a lot of confusion, there's a lot of misinformation, propaganda, brainwashing, some even saying Israel is the criminal. Can you, ima can you imagine that? A, a, a newborn child, an elderly 90-year-old woman, a woman raped, and abused in public, spat at, laughing at, mocking, dead bodies, torture. That already is beyond. There are many ways to deal with disagreements. Listen, the Jewish people, six million of them were massacred in the genocide called the Holocaust. Did the Jews go for vengeance and start attacking all the innocent people in Germany? Yes, during the war, they bombed Dresden, was completely destroyed. 
as so many other cities because that's what you need to do in defense of innocent life. But did the grievances that we have had, I'm talking to the Jews, turn into terrorism? So the most important thing to know when it comes to this is the clarity. The clarity that, and this is something that the Jewish people can teach the entire world, we are here, the only nation, barely 15 million people amidst 8 billion that survived all the challenges in history. The great empires, and just to name a few, especially those that oppressed Jews, the Egyptian Empire, the Assyrian Empire, the Greek Empire, the Persian Empire, the Babylonian Empire, the Roman Empire, the Ottoman Empire, the Spanish Empire. The list goes on. There's absolutely no link today to those empires. They don't, don't exist. Yes, obviously we have, they, they're ancestors, but they don't exist. And they had great armies and great wealth and a tremendous amount of land and control and power. So everyone asked a tremendously big question, how is it that the Jews made it? Just a for a small number of people, and for thousands of years without a land, let alone without an army, completely at the mercy of, it, of, the, of their hosts, and unfortunately suffered because of it. And we're here, standing strong. The answer is because we looked a tragedy this way with a dual, I would say even paradoxical perspective, which is a lesson for everyone. Everyone. Eight billion people on this earth, including Hamas, including our enemies. And the lesson is we don't cower in fear. We don't go into denial. We don't escape the pain of life and the suffering we may endure. We look at it in its eyes. We don't turn the other cheek. We'll do whatever it takes to defend ourselves. We understand what evil is. However, here's the other side of the coin. But we're not defined by it. We're not defined by our suffering. Our identities are defined by the fact that we were created in the divine image, in the words of the Declaration of Independence, that all people or men are created equal, which means all people, and have inalienable rights endowed by the Creator. That's who we are. We may go through suffering, endure suffering, but we're not defined by it. So even when we defend ourselves, when we have to protect ourselves, we're not warriors by nature. We're people of peace, of love. That's all we want. Our mission in this world is to transform the world into a garden. I was speaking to a group of children, parents, educators asking, how do you explain what's going on to children? Yeah, you can, you can somewhat obscure, you can somewhat um, hide many of the facts, but at the end of the day, it's almost impossible to ignore. The answer is very simple. We tell our children that God created the world for a purpose. The purpose is to make it a beautiful garden. But he gave us free choice and free will. And there are two paths in life, as the Bible puts it. I will give you the two paths, the path of life and the path of the opposite of life. Well, you shall choose life. We were given choice. That's our mission in this world. Unfortunately, there are people who choose the opposite, the dark path. And we explain exactly that. When we're faced with darkness, what we have to do is do everything possible to not allow it to control and protect ourselves. But at the same time, we have to realize light is more powerful than darkness. And a little light dispels darkness. What does light mean? That you are not defined and your identity is not defined by enemies. It's by light, by love. And ultimately, while we fight a war, we're also fighting a spiritual war. And the spiritual war is a war of our values, our unity, our love, a deeper connection to something greater than ourselves, that gives us the resilience and the strength to get through anything. That's the secret. Why is that difficult to replicate? Because to implement that is not easy. You need deep faith, but at the same time also deep intelligence. And to understand 
to go back to the biggest question, why? Why did God allow this to happen? Why is this happening? That we don't understand everything. There are mysteries about life and death that we will never understand. And that's not a statement from weakness, that's a statement of strength. That does not create passivity. It's actually respecting the dignity and the mystique, the mystery of life. Because at the end of the day, the real question that we have to ask is not why it happens. Why bad things happen to good people. But what are we going to do about it? But before I get to that, let's just cover also the how. And what's going on behind the scenes. So here is not the time for a full analysis. We've created a special section on MeaningfulLife.com. It's right on our homepage with links to a bunch of videos and articles that I have written now and over time. Unfortunately, this is not the first battle and war fought in that region. To explain some of the deeper battle, the deeper religious battle, why is there such hatred? So I don't want to go that into detail, just to say the following. This is not a war over land and resources and money and even power. It is ideological and religious. For the radicals and the extremists that want to wipe Israel off the map, for them is driven by the ideology that the very existence of Israel and the existence of Jews is a threat to what they believe in. That Islam should be the dominant and the only religion. Not Christianity and not Judaism. We Jews don't believe that every person has to, nobody has to convert. Be a good Muslim, be a good Christian, be a good human being, whatever it is that you believe in. Why is it important to know? Because people feel that it's all about grievances. That after being treated in such a way, so speak, the Arab population is revolting against being isolated, living in harrowing conditions. That's not true at all. Are they have harrowing conditions? Yes, but it's part of their own leadership fault. We're the bunkers of the Hamas leadership, under hospitals, under schools. Who did that? Who does that? Who uses innocent people to protect themselves? So as I said, I don't want to go into the ideology, but it's important to, so I would encourage everyone to educate yourself. Learn about it. Learn the facts. Know how to dispel and separate between myth and facts, between propaganda and truth. And that's part of what we have to do in what we can do. To be clear about it. A lot of Problems come from the confusion. Before we go into more details, let me say this. In life, there are really two choices. You're either part of the problem or you're part of the solution. The myth that there's a third category, the undecided, the bystanders that are observing and don't want to get involved is is exactly that a myth. Silence in the face of atrocities is complicity, as we saw during the Holocaust and today as well. There are three types of people, people who make things happen, people who watch things happen, and people who ask what happened. We have two options. Either we make things happen or we become part of the problem. So the first thing to know is that when even one innocent person is attacked, All innocent people are attacked. What a church will say that appeasement to enemies is like feeding the crocodiles in the hope you'll be eaten last. For some reason, the Jews are the miner's canary, the lightning rod. You see an attack on Jews, rest assured, that attack will spread. So we're all in it together. To take it even a further step on a mystical level, even from a scientific level, we're all one organism. One part of a body is ailing, another part is hurting as well. We're not separate entities, even though in our illusion we may feel we are. 
And when one part is strong, it strengthens the rest of the body. So we are responsible to act. So then the question is, what can we do? But first we need to understand the compelling sense of urgency involved here. So the first thing we have to know that we must play a role. And let's begin with education, a role of first clarity, understanding what's going on, being able to explain it to others, not to allow ourselves to be brainwashed by propaganda, by misinformation, especially today with social media and technology. Empower yourself with knowledge. Know what is going on. And if you need to research it, research it. Now, obviously, we're in the middle of a real war. So there's a, we don't always have time for everyone to get educated. But it's something that each of us, the more you get educated, the more you can make independent decisions, not based on what someone else is telling you. But let's move to the true actions besides that. Ultimately, this is a test of who we stand, who we are and what we stand for. That's what happens, unfortunately, in times of war. It crystallizes our values. What do we stand for? What are we ready to fight for? So define, that, this define our values. What is right? What is wrong? And that leads me to what we do about it. That ultimately, we are divine creatures, spiritual souls on a physical journey, not physical beings on a spiritual journey. Ultimately, light, love, unity, peace, harmony is our natural selves. However, as we read in the book of Genesis this week, there is darkness and light. And we have to choose light. And understand that our passion for light is stronger than the forces of evil. So what does that mean in simple English? It means that the battle that we need to fight side by side, simultaneously with the physical battles that need to be fought to protect innocent people is a spiritual battle to bring more goodness into our lives. Reach out, say a kind word, do an extra good deed, acts of kindness, a mitzvah. And that goes hand in hand. As I said earlier, the Jewish survival can teach us that the battles were not just fought on physical terms. It was also a battle of our, over our souls, over our faith. As one Jew who was about to be killed by a Nazi told the Nazi, as he was whispering his final prayers, the Nazi allowed him to do. The Nazi asked him, what are you saying? He says, I'm thanking God. He says, what are you thanking God for, you miserable Jew? You're, you're at my mercy. Where's your God? And the Jew said calmly, I'm thanking God that he did not create me like you. Understanding that ultimately goodness will prevail. So every time we do an act of good, it has the butterfly ripple effect that affects, yes, the Middle East, affects Israel, affects the battles there. So while there needs to be the physical battles to do everything possible, as I said, to protect and defend the innocent, and obviously, if you can do something in that direction, whether you're a reservist or you want to support it financially or in other ways, absolutely, that's another thing we must do. But together, the, together with that also comes the spiritual. No army can win, even with the greatest weapons and the most powerful resources, if their morale, if their moral conviction, if their souls are not cl clear with the fortitude and courage in the, in the importance of this war. So that's a major battle. It's a psychological one to put ourselves, our hearts, our souls, our minds, our, our attitudes. And then there are specific mitzvot, specific good deeds that actually, for Jewish people, for men, after bar mitzvah, to put on tefillin every day. That has a power. The Bible tells us it has the power to drive fear into our enemies. And we've seen it during the Six-Day War, Yom Kippur War, that this mysterious box that's put on the head and on the left arm, for right, is, um, was strange. And they thought it was a weapon. They thought it was a grenade, whatever they thought it was. It is a weapon, but it's a spiritual weapon. We're coming from Sukkot, 
which led to this tragic war in Simchas Torah, the four species we took are compared to weapons, spiritual weapons. Remembering the verse that says, it's not with our armies and with our strength, it's with our spirits that we fight. Which goes again hand in hand with what needs to be done on the ground, or in the air for that matter. Putting up a mezuzah on your door, which is a symbol and has the power of protection. For women and girls to light candles before Shabbat, before holidays. A candle is a light. Light dispels darkness. But in truth, every good deed done by everyone, I mentioned a few for the Jewish people, but the universal laws of being kinder, being gentler, being more moral, being more ethical, thanking God every day for your existence, saying, Moda'ani, I thank you for returning my soul to me and giving me an indispensable mission. All these are forces that absolutely have direct impact. We may say, how is that going to affect the terrorist? How is that going to protect someone? As I said, life is a mystery. We don't know many things. But we do know that today, energy affects matter. When you release and unleash the tremendous resources of the soul, of your spiritual being, it changes the world. And technology is the best proof of it. Let us use technology, not as others are using it as a weapon, but as a force of sending a message. Every day send an inspiring message, an inspiring image, kind words to others, to your list, to strangers. And finally, what, I don't want to say the word finally because there's so much more that we can do, but above all, unity. When you see such hatred. Not just diversity, but divisiveness. Hatred, to the point of brutality. So in addition to protecting ourselves, we fight hatred with love. No, not love to someone who's going to kill us, who's ready to kill us, but love to each other. Call up someone that you may have not been spoke, not spoken to, that may have been a rift, a family member or a stranger. Forgive and ask for forgiveness. This is a time where we come together. And again, we demonstrate that our commitment to light is stronger than their commitment to darkness. Our passion for goodness and kindness is stronger than their passion for blood. And that light will prevail. We need to know that firmly, absolutely. And if you look at history, we see that. Though through all the pains and through all the suffering, from the Jewish point of view, we have prevailed. We're here. Perhaps limping a bit, wounded, hurt, but we're here. And not only here and survived, we have a message. I'm a message, and I'm, I'm a proud Jew sharing a message, not just for Jews, but for the world. That the Jews have brought to this world civilization, the values that Abraham taught almost 4,000 years ago of justice, of love. Praying for infidels, Abraham did. So all the values we so cherish go back thousands of years and it's the Jewish people that we should be thanking for that instead of attacking. Our very enemies, their very religion and their faith comes from Judaism, which is, of course, the irony of all ironies, how Abraham, their grandfather, would react to such behavior. A man of chesed, of kindness, of benevolence, of, of care, of love. In the book, Thomas Cahill, The Gifts of the Jews, he explains, I think, 30 words, 30 ideas that the Jews contributed. And these are words like optimism, destiny, faith, trust, everything we uphold as being the most important values in our lives. There's an interesting measure that says, out of the non-Jewish world, including our enemies, would know what kind of blessings and protection they receive from the Jewish, through the Jewish people, through Israel, through Jerusalem, through the Holy Temple, not only would they not attack it, they would surround it with legions to protect it because it's the source of their own blessings. Think of the, the irony of ironies, the, the tragic irony 
in that concept. And that's what we're here to say. And that morning, Simcha's Torah, when the attack happened, what were Jews saying in synagogues? We were dancing with the Torah, the eternal Torah. We were celebrating indestructibility. And in the last of the 17 verses that we say before dancing, what does it say? Kimetzian Seitzei Torah. From Zion will come Torah. V'dvar Hashem Yerushalayim. And the words of God, the word of God from Jerusalem. That's what we said. The ultimate export from Israel is not weapons, it's not war, it's not technology, it's not startup companies. The ultimate export is the word of God. It's Torah. It's the mandate the divine mandate we received, how to transform this world into a beautiful world, a messianic world, a world of harmony, a world of peace, and no more famine, no more war, no more avarice, no more anger, the elimination of everything that is impure. That's what we were saying. And we will continue to say that. This does not daunt us, this does not change anything in what we believe in. Our hearts are broken, but our resolve remains absolutely stronger than ever. And, there, and therein lies the resilience and the power and the knowledge that we will prevail. So my dear friends, both our brothers and sisters in Israel and everywhere, stay strong. Remember, when you're connected to above, you don't fall below. This is the time to dig deeper and find those resources that give us strength, courage, confidence, fortitude, guidance, and direction to be part of the solution, to not be a bystander. Every one of us has a role to play. We're all part of this. The role of educating ourselves and others, being clear, the role of moral conviction, understanding what is right and what is wrong. Any possible way to show our solidarity with Israel Obviously, if you have a physical way to help, whether it's financially or actually helping the, the actual battles. And, of course, the role of the spiritual war that each of us is part of. We, meet, we mobilize ourselves, enlist in this battle. It's a battle of good over evil, of light over darkness. And the light will prevail. Amen. God bless you. God bless every man, woman, and child in the Holy Land, and all innocent people everywhere, and especially those protecting and defending the innocent. God bless them to stay intact and healthy. May the hostages be released intact, without any harm, without injury. And may we merit as soon as possible to tip the scales and bring personal and global redemption to this ailing world. This is Simon Jacobson, Meaningful Life Center, MeaningfulLife.com. And just as I just stated, we are, we've enlisted ourselves, the Meaningful Life Center, including myself, in war mode to be hopefully a source of hope, a source of direction, a source of inspiration, clarity as much as possible in these times of confusion. To not just be overwhelmed by all of this, but to know what we must do. And we've created, as I mentioned, a special section on our site with many different resources in, and tools that are vital for ourselves, for our children, for everyone that we're in contact with. So please take advantage of that. I'd love to hear your comments, your feedback, <laughs> excuse me, your suggestions. And above all, please share. Please share the ripple effect. Thank you. Be well. This program is brought to you by the Meaningful Life Center. Please help us continue our programs. Make even a small contribution at MeaningfulLife.com donate.